So I am a first year PA student at the University of Toronto. I did my undergraduate studies in biology at the uh, Trinity Western University in British Columbia. And then uh, directly after finishing that degree, I went to Queen's University uh, to complete a one-year master's in aging and health. And then after that, I worked for a year and collected my healthcare experience hours working as a medical receptionist. And during that year, I applied to PA school, um, both uh, McMaster and U of T programs, and was accepted at both, and then accepted my um, invitation to the University of Toronto, and am now uh, just about done my first semester. Can you tell us how did you come across the PA profession? So uh, for me, it was a couple times I came across the profession and also the decision to like, pursue PA school was not like a one-time um, big decision. I, I've heard from some students, they hear about the profession, they're like, oh, I'm definitely going to go in. For me, I, I first heard about the profession, I think in my fourth year of undergrad, it was a family member who knew someone like that they had graduated with that went into the profession and so they heard a little bit about it so I decided to do a little bit of research after I heard that just to look up um, what is the PA profession and it definitely intrigued me but at the time I was very focused on my like the path that I had set out since probably about grade 12 was uh, I'm definitely going into medical school like that's my focus so I thought wow that's a really good profession but I'm just sticking with my focus um, for medical school. So I uh, finished my schooling and I went to complete my master's and in my master's I was also preparing to retake the MCAT and then during that whole process I really came to um, realize that if I was going to continue through the process I needed to know why I wanted to specifically be uh, a medical doctor as opposed to a different profession. Um, so that's when I started to do a bit more research uh, and then I came across the PA profession again and I really uh, looked into it a bit more and I thought, wow, this is really cool. This is great. Like I am writing out a list of all the things that I wanted of a career and I feel that the PA profession can give me that. And there were just kind of a few things about the medical school path that um, were kind of drawbacks for me and some things that I learned too that um, just didn't sit well with me the same way as pursuing the PA profession. So um, by doing that research again, I came across um, your page N and just saw all the different students that were in the program and learned a lot more about it. And then I also attended a couple of the, the sessions the schools put on um, to show what their programs are like. And so that helped inform my decision a little bit more as well, because I was further able to understand um, from the eyes of practicing PAs, what does it look like to be a, a PA? So those are kind of the different ways that I found out about it. And then through that kind of learning process really guided my decision. What were specific things that drew you to the PA profession? So I would say the biggest piece was the collaborative role that PAs play. So working as a medical receptionist, I had a really great opportunity. There were some like lovely doctors I was working with just to chat with them and kind of pick their brain about what it looks like to um, be a family doctor. Um, and also one of them had been an emergency doctor as well. So I got to kind of hear that side as well. And the kind of responsibility it requires and the time commitment and the length of schooling and in terms of flexibility in the career, um, there is a lot of flexibility, but from my understanding, um, you kind of have to really develop your skills first and then become established and then you have lots of flexibility in your career, but it takes time to get to that point. And so for me, um, seeing as a physician assistant, just the uh, opportunity to have tons of flexibility in terms of areas of practice. If I want to develop my understanding of medicine in different fields, the flex like the lateral mobility, and then also the collaborative role that PAs play um, in terms of decision making. Yes, PAs make lots of decisions by themselves, but also in consultation with their supervising physician. And I really like that shared decision making process. And I think it's really great for patients, um, just allowing opportunities to extend care, 
And also the larger kind of goal of the PA profession, improving access to patient care. I just think that's really cool and something I wanted to be a part of. So all those things really drew me to the PA profession and things I want to like, accomplish um, in my personal career goals were all very much attainable pursuing the PA profession. So those conversations, um, lots of personal reflection, and just uh, what I saw from working, like my little bit of exposure in the medical field really drew me to the PA profession. And can you describe what that self-reflection process involved? Um, was it conversations you were having? Uh, what kind of questions were you asking yourself to really decipher whether or not you wanted to pursue PA? Yeah, so I took, I would say maybe about two and a half three weeks, like very intentional while I was working to be like, okay, I really want to make a decision that I'm comfortable with because I, a couple of family members were saying to me like, why don't you just apply for both? If you're not sure, you are still thinking you might want to pursue the MD route, just apply for both and then see what happens. And for me, like I knew I wanted to have um, like, a strong decision that I was comfortable with. And I knew that I could come to that decision if I had just like done some self-reflection on both paths. So, and I think that also to going through that process would then make me a stronger candidate for either program because I took the time to really think about why I would be best suited for which career and why I was more passionate about one more over the other. They're both great careers, but just um, going through that process, obviously. So I um, took some time to journal and I wrote down all of my career goals and all the things I, at that time, really wanted to uh, kind of pursue or things I wanted to challenge myself in and grow. And then I wrote down all the pros and cons for myself for medical school versus PA school. And then I just yeah, did some self-reflection too on some different jobs I've had and positions I've been in and what I enjoyed most and where I excelled in most. And then that kind of all aligned along with some conversations with family and friends who know me well and um, some practicing PAs as well as the doctors in the clinic. And that all led to my decision. And can you just remind us what stage of your academic career you were in when you were having this self-reflection? So I was finishing my master's. So uh, I actually like was con really considering the PA program after application season had closed that year. So it was, I think it was like February or March or something of my master's. So the year after I had finished my undergrad and that's when I really started to look into it. And then it wasn't, I think probably until September that I had a really firm decision and I had gone through that reflection process and had those conversations. And I, yeah, I had my MCAT date booked and I was, cause I was thinking of studying that summer, but I had made that decision, I guess a little bit before that then, cause I canceled my MCAT. I was like, no, this is what I'm going to go for. And some of my family members were like, oh, you could just go for both. Um, but once they saw that, like I was passionate about the decision, there was like lots of support. So it's great. And what kind of conversations were you having with your family? Did a lot of them, um, sort of wonder what PAs were, how did you explain the role to them? Uh, definitely. So because the profession is so new and the only way I kind of had heard about it is one family member knew somebody who was PA, nobody else in my family knew what a PA was. So there's a lot of explaining. And I think to even inviting them to come along the process with me. So, hey, like, let's watch this video together on like a PA explaining what they do. So to bring them into that process and then also just going through my pro thought process out loud. Sometimes I like to like verbalize oh, what I'm thinking through. So um, having those conversations with them, they could see like how passionate I was about it and um, how it aligned with my career goals and what I wanted. So I think bringing them along the process allowed that to be more of like um transitional decision as opposed to this is something I'm doing and then they have no idea what that is and then there's some resistance so um, I think that really helped um, bring to light some understanding for them of what the profession is and then why I was pursuing it. Um, what interviews or who did you listen to 
any particular students or specialty that uh, videos that you were watching that really resonated with you? Um, one in particular that I think of is when I went to the um, McMaster um, information session on their PA program. It was in person. So I went with my mom and we had like listened to all the PAs standing up there, like the different um, professions they were practicing in. And then there was this one individual who said that she had gone on um, like an overseas trip to do some like global um medical work and so that was definitely of interest to me because kind of my two areas of interest in medicine um are like working with the older adult population and also I have an interest in working kind of like international medicine in um in different ways that are available with like established programs so I had the opportunity to talk with her afterwards and that was really neat um because I think that was something that I thought oh maybe if peas aren't established as well there aren't as many opportunities for them to be involved in those sort of larger organizations that have those focus um because you, sometimes you do need to have that MD title to do certain things so um I like talking to her was really neat because that allowed me to kind of hear about that. And then my mom hearing in on my conversation with her too, then saw, okay, no, this is like a really great fit for Hannah. And I think that this would be a really great opportunity. So that was one in particular. And then also some of like the featured um, PA, uh, practicing PAs on your website and definitely looked at those. And I was just so so interested in seeing the diverse fields that PAs were practicing in and how um, their roles looked a little bit different depending on what area of medicine that they were practicing in. So those are the two kind of main things that stick out to me. Yeah, so the PA that Hannah is talking about is Maggie Hitchen, who's a physical medicine and rehabilitation PA. Uh, works in Hamilton. We've also interviewed her as well, and she's done mission trips overseas. There are many examples of uh, Canadian PAs who have gone. So even though we can only technically practice in Canada on a long-term basis, there are many global and international opportunities. Will you go for a couple weeks uh, or a few months um, working in places like Haiti or um, the Himalayas or South America? There's different opportunities, a little bit different now with COVID, um, but we've had students do international placements as well where you're really exposed to rural uh, and global as well as travel medicine. Can you tell me what you think made you stand out on PA admissions? Going through that process of deciding why I want to be a PA um, really helped develop my understanding about what PAs do and how they play a role with all the different other members of the healthcare team. I also had the opportunity to do a little bit of shadowing for like with an SLP. And my sister is a dietitian, so she took me to the hospital and just like let me hang out with a couple of her friends. So an SLP, uh, like a pharmacist working within a hospital setting, um, an OTPT. So really understanding the roles of all the different allied healthcare professions and all the different individuals on the healthcare team is, I think, really important in the application process because it shows why you want to specifically be a PA as opposed to um, a different healthcare profession because there are some over overarching goals that are shared between all. And so I think to make your application more specific, you have to hone on in on what makes um what makes a PA unique compared to those other professions and why specifically you have those skills or have developed those skills or have been encouraged to by different uh, opportunities you've had in extracurriculars, in job positions, in volunteer work. And so I specifically, I made a little Excel sheet with like the CanMed roles, a list of like every volunteer job kind of major experience that really was impactful for me and then took the time to kind of attribute those different can med roles so uh, the can med pa roles um, to each of those experiences and so by doing that um, i just had this um, base then kind of of how the different things that i had done through volunteer job, et cetera, had developed those specific rules. And that was why um, I had developed these qualities that would make me a good fit for the PA profession. 
And can you speak to some of those soft skills or qualities that you think make an ideal PA candidate or a really stellar practicing PA? Yeah, I think definitely the ability to work in a team is really important. Um, and to do that well, you need strong communication skills. Um, you need to be able to collaborate well with others. And it's challenging because every team you work with sometimes you develop different skills. So I think the more opportunity you have to be in those sort of settings, and when you do encounter resistance or conflict to really take time to consider what's working well, what didn't work well, is there something that I need to work on to further my communication with my group members who maybe think differently than me, who communicate differently than me, um, to just really be able to develop those skills and then bring those into the next experience you have. And then again, take that time to self-reflect. So uh, those are kind of the things that I think help develop those soft skills. Uh, and also just putting yourself in positions that maybe are a little bit uncomfortable. I think those are the opportunities that we have to grow the most uh, in those kind of skills. So maybe if you know that you're not the the like you struggle with um, working in a team, then maybe you want to put yourself in a group discussion forum or something you meet once a week to discuss issues and you're just working and talking with others. And maybe that's a way just to, to build those um, team skills, or maybe you want to develop your leadership skills and then taking on a new leadership opportunity within your uh, school or within a volunteer setting that you might be working at. So you think, identifying what skills you're strong at, which ones you're weak at, and then going through the process of self-reflection is how you develop those soft skills. And can you tell us a little bit about what your uh, experiences were in undergrad when it came to work outside of the classroom? Um, some of the experiences that really stood out to you uh, that helped you develop some of those CanMed's competencies. So leadership, professionalism, collaboration, teamwork. Um, what what experiences helped you develop those skills? Yeah, so I really like being involved in a lot of extra things. I have to be cautious about it because I, um, I like to be uh, involved in different groups and activities and challenging myself. Um, so it's definitely a balance, but I was involved in quite a few things at undergrad. And some of the things that really stick out to me that I enjoyed um, were some of the things that I could progress over the four years. So one of the things specifically was being on the biology club at our school. The first couple years, I was a volunteer. So I just helped with the blood drives, um, collecting individuals who were wanting to participate. And then also some of the social events. And then as I went to my third year, I got on kind of like the leadership team. And then on my fourth year, I became the um, VP of the club. So uh, that progression allowed me to see different parts of the club. And I think I was able to then step into the leadership role at the end, which was neat because it just allowed for contacts with different individuals on campus, which was cool. And then just being able to organize some of the events such as um, the blood drive that we had going on. So that was something that was neat. Another thing for me um, that was kind of just a, a good outlet because it encouraged me to have a bit more balance was my first and second year, I was very much involved in the running club at our school. Um, and then I had a bit of an injury, so I couldn't continue with that. But then in my last year, I was able to be a fitness instructor on campus. So being an instructor role was lots of fun and it was something I enjoyed. So pairing something that you enjoy while also being able to develop leadership skills is really great. And then the last thing, I had a couple opportunities to um, be a uh, tutorial instructor for calculus and then also um, a, like a lab prep uh, for first year chemistry. And then also I got to teach a, a first year chem class. So those opportunities, they really uh, encouraged my uh, passion for leading and instructing. And so I learned those things about myself through being in those roles. And then it was also just such a great balance from the demanding courses in undergrad. Yeah, so it sounds like you were really, really well-rounded. And something that I noticed actually when you were speaking was that not once did you mention that having a competitive GPA was an absolute necessity to get in. You focus more on the soft skills and these experiences and self-reflection. So it's really about being well-rounded and holistic and pursuing what you're very passionate about. Um, 
how did you come across these opportunities? I think coming across those opportunities is um, definitely helpful by just talking with other classmates. Um, because sometimes like they have different connections that you don't have. So if you're not necessarily maybe comfortable talking with like somebody who's like high up on the club themselves that you're interested in getting involved in, maybe just talking to a fellow classmate. Um, and then also I think attending different um, workshops or kind of events sometimes schools have for showing you all the different areas of things you can get involved in is something to watch out for because uh, it's sometimes not until you see something you're really passionate about that you're willing to kind of step out more of your comfort zone to get involved in that. So making sure that you're watching the different, uh, the different online platforms or kind of uh, like events that are going on that are telling you all the different opportunities that you can get involved in is important because you could find something that you click with a bit more um, than a group that you're not so passionate about. Okay. And um, do you mind sharing if you had a competitive GPA and what your approach was to maintaining good grades in undergrad and throughout your master's? So I have to be completely honest. When I first started undergrad, um, like my first set of midterms were horrible. Like I, I did like fine. I got probably like 70s. It wasn't great. Like I had never gotten those marks before. And I remember like this like phone call. I was on um, talking to my mom and I was like, I don't think I'm cut out for university. Like I am just drowning here. So um, that was such a like I think pivotal point in my undergrad in terms of like pursuing a high GPA because I thought that that just because I had gotten one poor mark on a test that I wasn't used to, that I couldn't move forward. And so I think um, resilience is like an important key for like keep having a high GPA because having a high GPA doesn't mean you have a high mark on every single test. It means that if you get a low mark on a test, you put in that extra work and that you seek out help and you reflect on like, what did work in my studying? What didn't work in my studying? And then you move forward from that um, because there's always going to be resistance that you're going to encounter. So figuring out how you study best for each subject and spending that extra time talking with your instructors, um, going to a couple extra study groups really um, allows you to kind of bounce back from those um, lower marks or even just like a low class. So I think um, you have to have that long-term perseverance in order to keep up those high grades because it is like a long haul. And so I think that would be a the biggest piece of advice I have for striving for a high GPA. What were your healthcare experience hours that uh, qualified you to apply to U of T? So I got the majority of my hours working as a um, medical assistant, medical receptionist at a family practice. And so I worked there part-time throughout my master's. And then I continued to work there the second year when I was applying to schools uh, because I, I had missed that application deadline um, during uh, my master's. So I had a year in between. So I got more hours through that. So two years experience with that. And then I also had the opportunity to go overseas uh, with a um, family friend who is a registered nurse to observe healthcare in Malawi. And so I was at a clinic every day for three weeks. So I got some hours there as well. But the majority of my hours came from working at a at the clinic and I think that was really great because it just allowed me to be exposed to the medical field a little bit more and just hear the terminology even if I had no idea that was what was going on and just uh, interact with patients and I also really came to learn the importance of communication with patients in terms of even just like relaying met short messages from doctors over and working with the other receptionist and just seeing the process within the medical field, like how referrals work um, and what different specialists are, because I didn't have much exposure before then. I think that was a really great opportunity for me to get feet wet. And this was direct paid patient care experience? Yes. Okay. How did you come across that opportunity or apply for that job? Did it require certifications? Was there a special connection? Were you a volunteer beforehand? 
Um, so I connected there because um, my mom like knew the family physician and they she said that they were hiring at the time and I was coming home from out west. So I was having a hard time looking for jobs. I was in another province um, because I couldn't really come in to apply anywhere. So everything had to be online. So it was just such a really great fit. Um, and I also want, knew I wanted to work part-time while I was doing my master's, but I just didn't know where. So it just kind of all fell into place. Um, I know some of those positions require like a certificate for medical terminology, which I think would have been helpful like for me to do if it required it because we had to take a medical terminology class at the beginning of um, our program. But it didn't require that or anything. And so um, having that connection was how I secured the job. But uh, since then, I've looked at different positions that are similar just because I was curious if other places required. And sometimes they do require um, those kind of certificates. Sometimes they don't. So it really just depends on the place. Any tips for pre-PA students on how to approach obtaining um, healthcare experience hours that would make them stand out on PA admissions? I think the the opportunity that you have to get direct patient care is really valuable. Uh, I think that's um, kind of posed as like a, a bit more valuable as opposed to indirect patient care because you do get a bit more exposure to the field. And then you also have opportunity and time to just practice like ch chatting with patients, which I think is really important because that's something you're going to have to develop right off the bat in PA school when you're starting to learn how to take medical histories. So learning how to develop rapport and um, be comfortable and also how to handle yourselves in emergency situations or something that's um, out of your comfort zone is something that I think can come from direct patient experience. But our, like our incoming class had a really a diverse range of um, areas that people collected their hours. So I really don't think that one area is necessarily better than the other. Um, and it, I think it can depend on the individual as well um, and maybe other volunteer opportunities that they've had that can supplement some of those skills. And um, during COVID-19, it's been a little bit more challenging for people to acquire healthcare experience hours. Any suggestions on what they can do to try to gain experience during this time? Yeah, that's a great question. It's definitely challenging. I've, I've seen a lot of students asking about that. Um, and I know, thankfully, uh, U of T like, has adjusted their admissions criteria, so you don't have to have the same number of hours, which is really great. Um, but I think you just need to get a bit creative in terms of where those opportunities lie. I think there's been some opportunities to be involved in like COVID screening, which I think would count as direct patient care. Um, always, though, you can email the admissions directly if you're curious if it counts or not. Um, they'll let you know. Um, but yeah, that opportunity, um, or also too, I'm really vouching for this type of job, but there, there are lots of opportunities, but I've seen some openings for medical like assistance still because those jobs are still needed. So if you uh, see those, you're welcome to apply for those as well, because those count uh, for direct hours. So can you break down the timeline for us of when you made the decision to apply to PA and when you actually applied? What were your steps in terms of how you prepared? So uh, when I heard about it, it was my last year of undergrad and I, I didn't really think about it too much more. And then in the spring term of my master's, I had heard about it and then did a lot of research, attended the different um, informational sessions um, and decided I was not going to pursue the empty path anymore. And then come September, I... Um, started preparing kind of like looking at the application process uh, for PA school. Uh, and then I submitted my application, I think it was due in like, January. Um, and during that time, I, I got a couple books to prepare kind of like for the interview, because from what I heard, like the Kira Talent interview, I heard, I think, it was SAF's interview on your YouTube. He was like, prepare kind of like the MMI. So I was like, okay, so what resources are important for that? So I picked up the, um, I had the Doing Right book before, but I didn't completely finish it because it's a very dense book, but I said, okay, I need to get through it now. So the Doing uh, Right book uh, for medical ethics, which is a really great book. 
It's, um, it's just very dense. And then the PA school interview guide by Savannah Perry. So I had those books and then I started kind of practicing interview um, things. And then I also made the Excel sheet that I was talking to you about. So writing a list of everything I had done, like volunteered for um, and different like jobs that I had had and different clubs that I was involved in. And I also tried to think of like some key pivotal experiences that develop different skills. So like when I was in an emergency situation and I really had to just um, act in the moment or when I was really stumped in a course and I really had to like learn how to be like scholarly and do a lot of extra research or develop those kind of research thinking skills of a master's. So um, I tried to like, think about key experiences. And then I had this like bank of things to pull from um, when I was practicing for interviews. So then when a question would come up, I'd kind of like roll decks in my mind. Okay, what experience applies to this question um, without being redundant? Because there are like lots of opportunities that I've had to be involved in different things. But sometimes I find that when you're in the hot seat or under pressure, it's really hard to think of those things. So if you've already done the legwork and think about the vast majority of experiences that you've had, it's a lot easier to pull from them. So um, that's how I kind of prepared in like the fall, spring. And then when I had my interviews and we found out they were virtual, then I just did lots of um, like video recordings of myself. I sat down with family members and just got them to interview with me, which um, was a little bit more uncomfortable than I thought it would be. Um, especially like seeing yourself answer things, it can be a bit intimidating. And also with your family members, because um, because they know you so well sometimes too, you can almost feel a little bit intimidated. Sometimes it's easier with a stranger going over those things. So I felt it was good going with family members because they really pushed me in my responses. And then I also set up like a mock MMI with like a good friend of mine. It was very, um, very sweet. We um, like I recorded message, like re recorded responses to the different questions and like submitted them to like a Dropbox. So I was um, like just preparing them and then we went over them together. Um, so that was nice just to get used to like doing something virtual and then practicing answering questions. You also mentioned journaling as a way of sort of developing your ideas and skills. Can I think you mentioned it on your Instagram, is that right? Yeah, for um, sure. So, can you describe what's involved in that and, and this idea of a call to action or writing goals intentionally through journaling and how that helps you? Yeah, so when I had made the decision to pr pursue a PA school, it was a little bit uncomfortable for myself because I had been um, like thinking that I was going to pursue medical school for so long. So to make that switch mentally was very challenging, I found, even though like other people were super encouraging and everything, I just felt for myself because I had been thinking one way for so long that that's what I was going to do. It was really challenging to switch my focus. So I thought, okay, so I'm going to try to write down that I'm going to PA school. And I specifically chose like a phrase that made it like an action phrase and that I was going to get in and when I was going to get in to make it something to seem like telling myself that this is what I want and this is when I'm going to get in. Um, when I knew that's what I wanted, but to kind of ingrain it more in my mind. So I like I take a couple moments, like a couple minutes each morning. I wasn't like super consistent, but just generally. And I would write down that like in May 2020, I'm going to get accepted to PA school. It's, it felt like super dumb, but it was really powerful because it allowed me to just mentally make that switch from pursuing um, like the MD route to compared to pursuing a PA role. And then it also allowed me to be more confident in my responses to people who are asking me like, oh, what are you doing? Or like, what are you pursuing? And I felt that I was able to answer that question better because it was what I wanted and it was what I was pursuing. And I was doing that really intentionally. And with regards to your approach to the written supplementary application for U of T, now of course the questions are confidential um, and the content of your answer is confidential. Um, but any tips about how to approach writing effectively uh, for admissions uh, in general? Um, so for me, I was like writing and rewriting a lot. I had some general themes that I knew I wanted to include in each of the questions, but then I 
kind of had to determine how I was going to communicate them and how I was going to communicate everything I wanted to say within the word count. So it was a lot of, yeah, definitely writing and rewriting, but I also wanted to make sure that I showed kind of as much as myself as I could. Um, and I've, I've tried to, I think I mentioned this um, once before in the live that I think I really tried to do because I think it's um, how the application process is set up allows you to um, show as much of yourself as possible as a candidate. Like they give you lots of opportunities like supplemental. Um, there's a couple different questions. You can show lots of different parts of yourself. And then also the interview, you can show more of yourself because there's so many students applying, right? So you want to be able to give them as much of a snapshot as yourself as you can within such a short time. So I think um, writing down what those key things are that you want to communicate at the end of the day is the most important thing for doing that supplemental. And then the words that you put in between and how you communicate that is something you just have to work on through editing and sending out to a couple family members, but not, not over editing too, because getting too much feedback sometimes can be um, uh, not helpful. <laughs> Yeah, those are excellent tips. Um, and one question that we have uh, from the audience is, um, after you applied, you received acceptances from both universities. Why did you choose one school over the other? And what were the different things that you were considering? Yeah, it's a, it's a really great question. I've had a couple students ask that. Um, and it's funny too, because if you asked me at different points in the admissions period, I would have told you different answers of where I was accepting which school. So it wasn't super straightforward because both programs are so great. And I think they both have really great focuses and things to offer. Um, like for example, like things that drew me to the different programs like for U of T their main focus is like improving access to healthcare, and they have a focus in like rural areas and so that was of interest to me because I thought that was a great opportunity to go up north and to really focus on like expanding access to healthcare in areas where healthcare is limited. So that was a really neat aspect of U of T. Also like the online focus of U of T was neat because I had done my master's online and so I had gotten comfortable with that platform and I'm pretty self-disciplined so I felt okay to go about like learning asynchronously a little bit um so that was interesting but then McMaster I was drawn to that program because they had the EPBL learning and so I know I was like a little hesitant to want to dive into that because it's something new for me and would be challenging but I thought it was just like a really great skill to develop. And so I thought that would be pretty neat about their program. And also they recently added like a geriatrics mandatory rotation to like the core clinical rotation. And so I thought, oh, that's really neat because I'm interested in that demographic and it's mandatory. Um, lo and behold, like for both, they have um, electives. So I could have chosen to pursue that at either school, but I just thought that was neat that they had it. So initially I was really thinking McMaster, but what ended up swaying my decision was was um, uh, just kind of the focus of like having more of like an online platform. And again, the opportunity to do half of those rotations up north for me, I think that was um, something I, I, I really wanted to do and wanted out of the program. So they're so great. And so, um, and they both have really great qualities, but for me, I think that the U of T was a bit of a better fit. For sure. So it sounds like um, reflecting on what your type of learning style is and looking at the different philosophies and the curriculum of the program and understanding what it's like to learn as a student is an important step. Honestly, like even gaining one acceptance is always so great because at the end of the day, we all graduate to the same jobs and apply to the same positions. So regardless of which school you go to, you still become a PA. But those are different nuances, I think, that not a lot of people realize and think about. So researching into the programs is definitely really important. What were your expectations of how hard PA school was? And then once you went through it, was there a difference? Was it a lot more volume of work than you expected? Is it truly the fire hydrant that you're trying to drink from in terms of the amount of information that you're, you're getting when it comes to learning medicine? Um, so I would say yes, that's definitely like a really great depiction of how the information comes at you. And I think too, it feels that way because um, like per like I have 
um, pretty high expectations that I put on myself when I am studying and when I am learning new material. And I think that's kind of like a shared quality along a lot of my classmates. So having that type of personality and being thrown into um, a type of learning where you learn very quickly that you do not know much um, is a little bit intimidating because you want to know everything. You want to be able to um, be like the best PA that you can and have that knowledge so you can help your patients. And so it can become extremely daunting because you see all that information and you're like, how am I supposed to know this all? And I'm not an expert in that at all. And so I think that's where it makes it feel more daunting because you have that expectation that you should know everything off the bat, especially when you're being thrown into case studies. And there's so many different parts of the cases that you have no idea about. Like I have no idea about medication. So how am I even supposed to approach this? Or I have no idea about this aspect. And then you fall in these rabbit holes of like research of about one thing and another thing. And you soon, the more you learn, the more re you realize like how little you know. And so I think that is like the most intimidating piece. But the thing that I've come to realize is like, I'm not expected to know everything right now. And the things that I am learning, it's, it's great. And I'm kind of encouraging myself to celebrate like where I was a few months ago and what I've learned now and how I could answer a few questions about a case without having to look them out. And that's something to celebrate. So I think um, celebrating uh, how far you've come is really important for uh, kind of managing that volume of information. And it did live up to my expectation. I kind of did anticipate it would be this intense, but the thing I didn't anticipate was like how much I would enjoy it. So I'm okay with the intensity. I think it's so much so different from undergrad where when a course is intense and you're kind of bummed because you're just going through it because you need it as a prerequisite to graduate. It's really hard to get that motivation to go through it. But so far with PA school, like there's days I don't want to get up early to start studying for sure. But in general, I'm really passionate about what I'm learning. So it changes my outlook on studying as a whole compared to undergrad. So it makes it um, more feasible. Do you have any idea what area or specialty you want to work in when you graduate? So I'm open, like I'm open-minded and I want it to be that way because I feel like my understanding about what the different specialties look like might be different when I actually do a rotation in it. So I think being open-minded will allow me to have like the best experiences in my clinical rotations as well, because I'm not going into the rotation thinking, well, I don't really want to do this. So I'm just going to kind of get through it. I want to think like, oh no, this is like an opportunity and a potential workplace for me in every rotation. So I'm very open, but areas of interest in medicine that I'm really passionate about is like, I really enjoy primary care. I don't necessarily know if I'm going to start out in that field, but it's uh, an area I'm really passionate about because I think there's so much opportunity for uh, developing relationship with patients over time uh, to develop that rapport and also for patient education and focusing on helping with different chronic diseases um, and management of that and following along people's journeys, health journeys, um, and being that support for them. So I really like that aspect of uh, primary care. Um, and also, I really enjoy working with the older adult population. I did my master's in that. And I think it's just a, a really neat population to work with. And I think that that's population you can work with in primary care, you can work with in a specialty in geriatrics, or you can work with in a lot of different fields. Um, so, and also international medicine is of interest for mine, but that's kind of, kind of like a side interest I think I would like to do, um, but not my main focus of my practice. And I think that's what's so unique that you can just remain open and you don't have to pick a specialty that you need to gun for. Unlike um, if you're in medical school and you have to pick where you're going to do your residency and practice for supposedly the rest of your life. Um, and the thing is, once you go through clerkship, I think you'll learn a lot about the pros and cons of each specialty and further narrow down what really, what really works for you and what you're very passionate about. Uh, so my question for you is that... Um, what inspired you to document your journey on Instagram? Um, because you do, uh, you started this at the beginning of uh, PA school or once you got accepted, right? 
Yes. And I had like planned that I was going to do it before then too. So there was definitely some anticipation for starting. I was pretty excited to start it up because um, I had like a very intentional focus for my Instagram. I had found that following uh, a few other Instagram accounts when I was going through the application process. Was, yes, so I had followed a couple of Instagram accounts when I was applying and I just found it super uh, interesting to see what it was like to be a PA student and the different uh, kind of um, ways that the programs were set up and how they were surviving PA school because I heard it was so intense and just um, hearing the different stories that they had to share with patients and everything. So there were a couple accounts, I'd say, I think um, at the time, Arthi's account was the main one that I was following for UFT and then SAF and then from McMaster University and then Carmen from Manitoba. I really appreciated how there was like a, um, students from each of the three programs. So you really got a glimpse of what the different programs were like. So I enjoyed seeing those different accounts. And so um, that kind of inspired me to think, oh, maybe this is something I could be involved in. So I really like being involved in different extracurricular activities. And given that the U of T program was online, I figured, hey, this is kind of like an extracurricular that I could be involved in, kind of doing a bit of advocacy for the PA prof uh, profession, but also offering some mentorship and leadership, because those are things that I'm really passionate about and I really enjoy. So um those are kind of the reasons why I decided to start my Instagram page. And it's been so awesome kind of being in communication with some uh, students who are interested in the PA profession and being able to share with them my experience and um, just encouraging them along the way and being able to celebrate with them because I think that's really exciting when it is such kind of like a new profession and it's not that big. It's nice to be able to kind of like encourage each other and celebrate, um, especially with COVID when we're all like, not being able to interact with each other as much. It's like this really neat community that's online. What ideas do you usually decide to, uh, to share and do you plan them ahead of time? Like what's your whole process around that? Yeah, so I like I try to be intentional to plan ahead of time, but I feel like I, I get too excited about one thing so that I'm just like, okay, I'll just post it. And then I like, I don't necessarily follow a strict schedule and I'd like to be a little bit more organized because I think it would help me, especially during busy weeks where I'm just like, okay, I'm just going to put my phone away for like a little while because I just can't. Um, and also like, I usually try to take like one day a week. I just turn off because I don't like, it's just a lot with school as well, but it is like a nice creative outlet. And I really enjoy that aspect of it. So for coming up with different ideas, oftentimes when I'm just coming like, when I'm just like thinking or doing something, I'm like, oh, hey, I wonder if like, this is something that I would be interested as like a, a pre-PA student like hearing about. So I just like write a little, like I have a little notes in my phone and I'm like, write it down. Like, okay, maybe that's something I could touch on. And then another big um, part about where I like come up with different ideas is just like through messages from students and they ask me different questions and I'm like, oh, that's a great question. Um, just post my response for everybody. So if anybody else had the same question, they can hear about it as well. Um, and then just trying to share a little bit about like personally how I'm dealing with PA school to be like as transparent um, uh, like about the PA school process um, I think like a couple weeks ago I was feeling so burnt out from school um, it was just like a lot of school and it's just really hard like being at home and there's just a lot going on right now so I felt extremely burnt out so I posted about it because I'm like okay I want to like mention that this is something that that happens and like how I'm coping with that so trying to be transparent on what is currently going on just thinking random things that pop in my head that may be of interest and then um the direct messages with pre -PS. um any any other uh, final words or notes you wanted to mention before we wrap up? I can think of. I'm just wishing everybody the best of luck with the application process because I know it's extremely stressful. So um, don't be too hard on yourself and don't do it all at once to get super overwhelmed. Take breaks in between if you need it. Um, yeah, and if you have any questions about PA school, you can always message me. Don't really have anything extra on that I just want to thank you Anne so much for having me it's been um 
so wonderful to chat with you a bit and like I said meet face to face because I've used so many of your resources it's so amazing like what you're doing for the PA community and how you progress like advocacy so much I think most of the most of the way people like learn more about the PA profession is just through going through the different profiles in your page and stuff it's just it's really awesome like community that you've created. Mm -hmm.